ESPN's College Game Day could have chosen anywhere in the country to kick off the college football season. They're headed to College Station for an electric matchup between Texas A&M and Notre Dame. To talk about the fighting Irish side of things, we have Tyler Horka from the Blue and Gold. Tyler, I know fall camp kicked off on Wednesday. You and Jack Sobel kind of compared it to the first day of school or Christmas. Tell me what the vibes have been like in South Bend so far. Yeah, it's definitely a mix of those two things. Obviously, Christmas, if you're a Christian, you know it's one of the best days of the year. It's a, a big time celebration, time to come together and be with family. But I also think the first day of school is also a time to get together with people that you haven't seen in a while and kind of celebrate the start of something new. And I know Christmas is at the end of the year, but first day of school, that's the beginning of the year type of vibes. You got all of these different guys. I mean, Notre Dame's got a lot of transfers. This is the most transfers that they've ever had in one offseason with eight. And some of those guys did not get to practice in spring ball because they were still enrolled elsewhere and obviously weren't enrolled at Notre Dame. So you got guys like Bo Collins coming into the mix, Rod Hurd, the safety from Northwestern. And it's just kind of cool to see all those new faces kind of integrated with some of the old ones. Obviously, Riley Leonard is not a new face at this point because – he transferred to Notre Dame in the spring, and, and he's been here since January. But he had a couple of surgeries on his ankle in those first couple months that he was in South Bend. So just kind of seeing him throw passes to Bo Collins, Jaden Thomas, Jaden Greathouse, Jordan Faison, all of these different Notre Dame wide receivers, I think that's a big storyline in this season too. Notre Dame might have more weapons than they've had in the last handful of seasons. I mean, this is a team that hasn't had an 1,000-yard wide receiver since 2019. That was Chase Claypool. So – they feel like they've got got some guys that can threaten that number, maybe even exceed that 1,000 yard mark, and and that's exciting. So that that's like the because because as much as people don't like going back to school, there is an exciting element to it, and obviously Christmas is very exciting as well. So I think that's kind of the overarching vibe that I'm getting out of South Bend right now is you've got a bunch of playmakers on both sides of the ball. You have a new offensive coordinator and Mike Denbrock, who obviously just led the number one offense in the country at LSU last year. Marcus Freeman's in his third season. Defensive coordinator Al Golden is in his third season at Notre Dame as well. So some established parts, some new parts, and I think it all comes to, together to create something pretty exciting. Definitely exciting in the college football season, and especially when you get in the month of August where things start to feel real. But you mentioned Riley Leonard. This is the second straight year now that an ACC quarterback has joined this team and kind of dominated the offseason talk. Talk about Riley Leonard. We know that off the field, it seems like he's really checking off a lot of those intangibles. But on the field, what have you seen from him early in camp and what are your expectations from this upcoming season? Yeah, he's a clear alpha in that room. And that's another room. I mentioned the Notre Dame wide receivers feeling like they're in a better spot than they've been in the last handful of years. I mean, you look at the Notre Dame quarterbacks from Riley Leonard, the established senior, all the way down to C.J. Carr, the freshman coming in, who's a Michigan legacy, could easily ended up there. Notre Dame obviously won the recruitment. And then you have a couple of other guys, Steve Angeli, Kenny Minchie, uh, a junior and a sophomore, respectively, who Notre Dame thinks really highly of. you got a really, really talented, good quarterback room, but Riley Leonard feels like the alpha in that room. And uh, Marcus Freeman said it best in his press conference. He didn't outright name – uh, Riley Leonard, the starting quarterback, which I think it's all we all know it's probably a foregone conclusion that when uh, the Irish go into College Station and have to play in front of 102,000 uh, screaming Texas A&M Aggie fans, it's going to be Riley Leonard who leads the Irish out there. And that's just the vibe that you get uh, from the practices. And, and, and Freeman said that Leonard is running with the ones and Angeli's running with the twos. That's what everybody expected. And, you know, you've kind of seen that we haven't we've got to watch the entire practice on Wednesday. Very vanilla, kind of an install type of day. Notre Dame ran 11 personnel the entire day. I don't think you're going to see that out of the Fighting Irish, obviously, against AM and beyond. But just in terms of, like, if, if you were to just keep your eyes honed in on that quarterback room, you know who the leader of that group is. It's Riley Leonard, the guy who started 21 games at Duke, accounted for over 3,600 yards in 2022, 33 total touchdowns in that season as well. That's the guy that Notre Dame thinks that they have, somebody that, Hopefully stays healthy because that did not happen in 2023. But when he is healthy and he's practicing and he's playing, uh, he's the best quarterback on this team. I think a lot of people believe that. And he's going to have the chance to show it on August 31st in College Station and, and then in 11 games thereafter as well. Definitely a lot of excitement surrounding Riley Leonard. And you mentioned the new offensive coordinator, Mike Denbrock. I feel like that's just a big key to this offense this year, along with Riley Leonard. This is a guy who was orchestrating LSU's offense when Jaden Daniels went and won the Heisman, two first round wide receiver picks as well. When you think about Riley Leonard having that dual threat ability, you're talking about the receiver room maybe looking as best as it's looked in quite some time for Notre Dame. How do you see this group of offensive weapons and skill players kind of translating with this offensive scheme now? 
Yeah, you got to remember that Notre Dame has one of the best tight ends in the country in Mitchell Evans. That's another guy that's obviously coming back from injury, though, as well. He tore his ACL in late October, I believe it was last year. He should be ready for the season opener and then every other game in the season. So that's a big thing because when in doubt, Riley Leonard told us Blue and Gold had a one on one with Riley Leonard in the offseason. And he said he's Mitchell Evans is kind of a when in doubt, throw it up to that guy type of player because he can go make a play. It's funny. I think in the game against Duke last year, Mitchell Evans had more receiving yards in a single game than any Notre Dame uh, tight end has ever had. He set the single game receiving mark, and I think he broke Michael Mayer's mark, which was just set a a couple of seasons prior. So Notre Dame is awesome at the tight end position, and that is exactly what Mike Denbrock loves because he loves to utilize those tight ends. You're going to see a bunch of different pass catchers in a bunch of different situations. Jeremiah Love, the running back, who everyone thinks is, you know, running back one, RB1. To be RB1 at a lot of different places across the country. You're going to see him line up as a receiver out of the slot. Jordan Faison, the guy that I mentioned last year, who's arguably Notre Dame's best wide receiver down the stretch of last season. Statistically, he was. Caught 300 and, or he had 302, 322, excuse me, receiving yards in the final half of last season. Nobody was doing what he was doing from the wide receiver position. He did all, the, all of that out of the slot. Denbrock has moved him to the field. Uh, in the first couple of days of fall camp. So you've just got so many moving parts. And I think that's the best way to describe it. So many different guys that can beat you. Obviously, Denbrock, when he has talent like that and guys that he can kind of utilize and put in different positions, you just saw it at LSU last year. I mean, LSU recruits skilled players as well as anyone in the country. And when Denbrock has that at his disposal, I think you're talking about one of the best offenses in the country. I don't know if Notre Dame is going to finish number one in total yards like LSU did last year. But I believe Notre Dame was somewhere around 30th last year. And you're probably looking at an offense with top 15 potential. I think a lot of people would be satisfied with top 20, knowing what Notre Dame has defensively backing this offense up. So it's really exciting knowing that Notre Dame can be maybe as explosive as the Irish have been in the last, I don't know, maybe, you know, maybe even the entire Brian Kelly era. I know that he played for a national title in 2012, went to a couple college football playoffs, but you might be talking about an offense. If the offensive line holds up, that has potential to be as good as it's been in South Bend in a really long time. No, I definitely think thinking about this offense, always consistently having an elite tight end, a nice run game, having other pieces that could potentially round out this attack seem like just the expectations and what this could be are super high. But getting more into this week one matchup, I want to talk about this Texas A&M game. I feel like when you look at the schedule for Notre Dame, there's not very many matchups that kind of stack up to this one. You have the Florida State matchup, obviously USC every year. But when you think about this game specifically, what would you say the stakes and maybe your early expectations are for this matchup? Yeah, you put it politely. I think more people around these parts in South Bend are just saying the the schedule plane is not good. It's just not a good schedule. So that's what heightens the stakes of this week one matchup because you are playing an SEC team. You are going to their turf, like I said earlier, in front of 102,000 fans at Kyle Field. So if you can get past this game, if you can notch a victory, and, and I've said it before, Notre Dame would sign up for a win of any kind. I don't care if they win three to two in this thing. And I think there is an SEC game that has finished with the score of three to two before. So it wouldn't be unprecedented, but obviously in today's era, it would be Notre Dame would still be happy with that. So I'm, I'm talking a 13 to 10, to 10 scrappy type of game. You know, if it ends up being higher scoring, which I don't think it'll be because like I mentioned, Al Golden's defense at Notre Dame is great. Mike Elko is going to go in there and install a really good Texas A&M defense from the jump. I truly believe that really good coach. Nobody knows that more than Riley Leonard as well. The two teamed up at Duke for a couple of seasons. In 2022, they had one of the best seasons in Blue Devils history and going nine and four. I think it's only been done seven or eight times in Duke history, winning nine games. So Elko is going to be a very very big challenge in everything that he brings to Texas A&M. And then you have all of those external factors, like I said, the the stadium, the heat. uh, You know, it's, It's not as hot up here in Indiana as it is down there in Texas. So It's a massive game, and if you can get any type of victory in that game, then you're looking at a couple of MAC teams in northern Illinois and uh, Miami of Ohio, and Notre Dame is playing two service academies in Navy, which they play every year, and then Army this year as well. And the cool part about that is, yeah, you get to go to uh, a couple of neutral sites for that in MetLife Stadium and Yankee Stadium, but the point being, the schedule is not that tough for Notre Dame this year. 
outside of Texas A&M. It is Florida State, as you mentioned. And then USC, I think, can surprise a lot of people at the end of the year. And it's also a rivalry game. And Notre Dame struggles in Los Angeles, no matter how good the Trojans are. So you've got three marquee matchups on your schedule. And this is one of them. And it comes in the very first game. So you really can't afford, if you're Notre Dame, to go down there and slip up. And if you do win that thing, you can't afford to also kind of let your guard down because maybe Northern Illinois takes a uh, a page out of the Marshall playbook and, and upsets Notre Dame in, in Notre Dame's home opener in early September. I mean, the precedent is there for that type of situation. So you have to treat this thing as if it's one of the biggest games of the season because it is, but then obviously you have 11 more after that. But if Notre Dame does win, I think they'll be riding high and, and the foundation for a college football playoff type of season would be set for sure. No, I think the foundation for this game, the table has been set for it to be a big one. And we know we haven't gotten too far into fall camp, but we talked about this offense and some of the changes there. This defense brings back nine starters. It's going to be one of the best units in the country. Maybe what specifically would you like to see from Notre Dame in this matchup that might give you more confidence about the team moving forward throughout this season? Yeah, play to your strengths. And you just mentioned it right there. there there's really no reason that Texas A&M well, I mentioned Mike Elko being a really good coach, and I think he's going to do a lot of really good things there. He's a defensive-minded head coach, and Jimbo Fisher was just fired, and he's an offensive-minded head coach. And, and quite simply, Texas A&M wasn't getting it done on that side of the ball in the Fisher era, not, not to the level that people thought. And you know, all the money that he got, you know, and I don't think he lived up to that, and Texas A&M lived up to that. So that being said, there's really no reason that Texas A&M should be able to move the ball on a defense that was top five in the country last year and returning all those starters, as you mentioned. Al Golden is in his third year as the defensive coordinator. That matters. And Notre Dame's really leaning into that, being able to say, hey, we've been in the same system for three years. We're going to be as good at it this year than we were in any of the previous two seasons. So th there's a lot to like on that side of the ball. And I think that's the biggest thing for Notre Dame is just not to let Texas A&M kind of run all over you, throw all over you, just walk all over you. That, that shouldn't be the case. And Because I do think uh, with all of these weapons that Notre Dame has and Mike Denbrock coming in to lead them, there might be some struggle on the offensive side of the ball early. You know, the, you're going to have to get used to uh, some of these differences and some of these different players being the ones that you lean on. So we might not see the best of Notre Dame's offense until October or November, but you should probably see a consistent Notre Dame defense from the very start of the season. And I think that's what they're going to lean on. Again, they would have no trouble winning a 14 to 10, uh, you know, 21 to 14 type of ball game. They, they won some of those last season. And if they did it again in week one in 2024, the Irish would be completely fine with that. Yeah, it's definitely going to be a time for answering a lot of questions. And I know Notre Dame fans will take any win they can get, no matter what the score is. But last question for you, Tyler, more of a big picture one. Obviously, the college football playoff is expanding to 12 teams this year. This is a team who made the playoff twice in the four-team playoff era. When you, talk, when you talk about just this team's expectations this year, they'll probably be ranked within the top 12 and trying to stay in that top 12. How much externally and internally is the college football playoff being talked about around this program? Oh, it's huge. And you might not get it from Marcus Freeman or Den Brock or – maybe even some of the players, but the media knows, the fans know. If you're Notre Dame, you can't afford to miss a 12-team playoff because that's eight more opportunities to get into this thing than there were before. And Notre Dame does have the unique situation of not being in a conference and not being able to earn one of those top four seeds. But you have to remember that Jack Swarbrick, the former athletic director that just gave way to Pete Bavacqua earlier this year, he was in the room with the people who devised this new college football playoff format. So the athletic director at Notre Dame knew that that would be the case. And, and he was fine with that because if Notre Dame goes 11 and one this season, you're looking at a home playoff game in December, maybe snowy South bend uh, for some team to, to walk into. So all, all you have to do if you're Notre Dame is play up to your potential. And I think you're in this college football playoff. Now there is the possibility that Notre Dame misses the playoff entirely at 10 and two. And that's where not having a conference championship game might hurt you if you're the Irish, because we've seen it as recently as 2021, Brian Kelly's last season in South Bend, the Irish went 11 and one and were a, a good team, top 10 team, pretty much the entire season. But that one loss was enough to keep the Irish out of the college football playoff. They finished at number five in the final rankings. If you go 10 and two this season against the schedule that I just talked about, which is not very good, and, you know, maybe, maybe you lose two really hard fought games against ranked teams, Texas A&M, Florida State or USC. 
and you know teams are teams lose and they still get in the college football playoff that's a thing but if you're Notre Dame and you don't have those marquee victories to to back up your resume with then you're talking about a Notre Dame team that might be 10 and 2 and, and sitting at number 13 14 15 in the rankings and out of this thing so I think 11 and 1 is the goal and that's the scary part about the Texas A&M game if 11 and 1 is your goal and somehow you go down there and, and just can't get the job done in a hostile environment you're talking about running the table thereafter and I know the schedule isn't isn't very difficult, but you have no margin for error at that point. So win the Texas A&M game, and then obviously you're, you're in a good position to beat Northern Illinois, Purdue, Miami of Ohio. You know, you have the foundation set for a 5-0, 6-0 start, whatever it is leading into that Florida State game in November. I think they will have played seven or eight games by that point. That's when you're talking, okay, we have that margin for error now. So it all starts with Texas A&M, but I do think the Irish are in a really good position to maybe go 11-1. Uh, and ten and two would would be a little dicey in terms of making it in, but I mean, I mean that that's kind of what this team is looking at. They're looking at a double digit regular season uh, victory total. Definitely just adds the intensity and stakes to this week one matchup. Really excited about the possibility of this program hosting a potential college playoff game. But Tyler, thanks for joining us so much. If you haven't gotten your membership to the Blue and Gold, you have to get one right now. There's no one covering the Fighting Irish quite like this crew that they have there constantly putting out content throughout fall camp they'll continue doing it throughout the entire season tyler thanks for joining us and of course if you haven't already subscribe to the round table give us a like give us a comment let us know how you feel and again tyler thanks so much yeah i appreciate you guys can't wait for the season